Okay, finally, we got to where I wanted to be. Okay, we are, we got as far um, on Tuesday through Zoom, we got to this point in the urinary system, we were just uh, looking at the renal regulation of the glomerular filtration rate. The, the GFR is really important for us. The GFR is going to be the rate of filtering urine uh, plasma through the kidneys determines how much waste is going to be taken out and how much is going to be left, be left behind. If our filtration rate is rapid, what will happen is that we don't have time to get all the waste products. We'll go through too quickly, we'll leave waste materials behind. If we're too slow, what will happen is the waste product will be covered. I mean, we'd be uh, uh, packed in the filtrate, but if the filtration rate is very slow, we'll have time to reabsorb all the nitrogenous uh, waste and large molecules that we're trying to get rid of. So we don't want to have a slow rate, we don't want to have a fast rate. Neither one is helpful. Now, and we know that we can control, you know, the kidneys can control the rate by uh, controlling the diameter of the afferent arterial. You can dilate the afferent arterial. You can um, constrict the afferent arterial so you maintain a constant pressure. The key to make, maintaining a good uh, regular uh, GFR, regular flow rate or filtration rate, is the pressure of the blood and the glomerulus, at least as far as the kidneys are concerned. These are the intrinsic controls. The kidneys will control filtration rate by controlling the pressure. High pressure, uh, we don't want high pressure. We want our pressure going into the glomerulus, say about 55 millimeters of mercury. So if our pressure gets too high, then we can constrict the afferent arterial and keep that pressure down. If the pressure gets too low, we can dilate the afferent arterial to maintain, have more blood going into the glomerulus to still maintain that 55 millimeters of mercury pressure. Remember, there is about 45 milliliters of back, back pressure. So what the, the end result is, the pressure going in, coming out of the uh, glomerulus, going into the proximal tubule is only about 10 millimeters of mercury. So it's a nice low pressure that won't damage the nephron. That's the problem we have with hypertension is that the kidneys are exposed to higher blood pressure and they're always trying to regulate against that or conversely low pressure. And if it's high pressure, the nephrons, which are very fragile, the nephrons are only one cell layer thick. Uh, and you know, there, are there are tubes, but the tubes are only one cell, you know, one cell thick all the way around. <laughs> those tubes, those tubules that make up the nephrons are going to get damaged. And one of the long-term consequences of hypertension is kidney damage. We also know that there are other ways to control the filtration rate. We have the extrinsic controls. Intrinsic is within the kidney. Extrinsic controls are outside the kidney. Uh, things that have an effect on the outside. We have neural mechanisms. The nervous system can control of the, uh, the the GFR, the uh, the sympathetic nervous system typically is not the dominant system in our body. But we have parasympathetic and sympathetic. Sympathetic system is usually fight or flight. The parasympathetic is rest, digest, and defecate, and we're you know, the dominant side of the autonomic system is the parasympathetic side. When we are functioning normally. Normal, yeah, but that's that's not for this class. Um, the sympathetic system is not doing anything. Our vessels are dilated, blood flows coming in, pressure going into the uh, glomerulus is 55 millimeters. What's going out of the glomerulus is 10 millimeters. Um, the kidneys' auto regulation mechanisms are at work. We don't need to involve sympathetic system at all. But if, and this is the, the big if here, if our blood pressure drops, 
is to maintain our kidney on the sympathetic side, we'll now have to take action. If we have a very low blood pressure uh, coming through the uh, kidney, you know, ECS, extra cellular fluid, low plasma. Because remember, plasma becomes interstitial fluid, becomes lymphatic fluid, and becomes back to plasma. And the fluid outside the cell is extracellular. Yeah. So if our blood volume is low, because if our blood volume is low, then our interstitial fluid is low, then our lymphatic fluid is low. If our blood volume is low, what, for whatever reason, reason, uh, well, maybe we just have uh, low blood pressure. Maybe we're not losing blood. Maybe our pressure is just really low. Uh, the the uh, sympathetic nervous system will take action by releasing norepinephrine and epinephrine from the adrenal medulla. Now you remember that norepinephrine causes vasoconstriction. We vasoconstrict the smooth muscle around, we always simulate the smooth muscle around the arterioles, causing a vasoconstriction of the vessel. When we narrow the vessel, pressure usually goes up. So we have a but here, when we're responding to low blood pressure in the kidney, the kidneys are a great place to monitor this. We will start, that will trigger the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Norepinephrine causes phase of constriction. Epinephrine increases the heart rate. It's a systemic effect. It doesn't just act on the afferent arterial, it acts on the bottom. So the kidneys will detect this uh, low blood pressure along with the baroreceptors in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus, the kidneys will detect it too. So the medulla uh, of the adrenal glands secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine. We get an increase in the heart rate. We get a vasoconstriction. The uh, blood pressure goes up. As our blood pressure goes up, and this is where it sounds a little uh, uh, counterintuitive, uh, we also constrict the afferent arterial because if our pressure goes up too high, the pressure in the glomerulus is going to get too high. So we constrict the afferent arterial, which lowers, which actually slows down the TFR to get where we want it to be. Because basic constriction is, you know, in this case, it is systemic. It isn't taken to. All the vessels are done in the body are done basic constriction. When we vasoconstrict the atrium arterial, it lowers the pressure in the glomerulus. It reduces the flow. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound right, but that's what's happening. And but since the overall uh, body pressure has come back up, it's okay to do that. We want that way we can still maintain the 55 millimeters of mercury. Our blood volume goes up, our blood pressure goes up, it rises. But the kidneys can adapt and maintain the, the constant 55 uh, millimeters. That is the nervous system control. If we have a drop in our blood pressure, for whatever reason, loss of blood, uh, loss of fluid volume, you know, your patient's dehydrated, typically dehydrated. That's going to affect the kidney because the, the fluid levels are going to drop. So the body's going to be a dehydrated person is going to have to respond with uh, a sympathetic uh, release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, we get the you know, vasoconstrict. Well, the you know, patient's behind it's not necessarily a good thing for this to be going on, but this is our response outside of any other influence. Now, the, the third mechanism is renin angiotensin aldosterone. I keep coming back to that, saying that over and over. Like it's like it's really important, and it, and it really is. Renin angiotensin aldosterone. This is the number one culprit or helper in raising blood pressure. We can. There are three ways that uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone works. Number one, the first one is to activate the granular cells. The cells that are wrapped around the afferent arterial, I'll show you here in a second. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system says, hey, you know, um, 
we need to raise the pressure. So it will stimulate the granular cells. Now the granular cells are where we release the renin. So we can stimulate the release of renin right there. And then renin goes on and activates angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 to aldosterone, and we retain sodium, and we retain water, and blood volume goes up to our first episode. He's saying that. Okay. The other way we can, there's another way we can detect it, is the presence or absence of um, sodium. In the distal tubule, we can detect the sodium concentration. Now, this is a nice little elegant procedure that our kidneys do for us because if sodium concentrations are low, it means the filtration rate is low because we've had so the filtration rate is the filtration rate is slow. The filtrate has more time passed through the kidney tubule. It sounds like a good thing. Hey, we have more time. We can clean it up even better. Well, what we see here is that if we're going through the kidney, the kidney tubules slowly, we're going to have time to suck more sodium out. And so the macula densa, the area inside the uh, distal tubule, detects this low sodium. He says, well, the sodium's low, then we're probably operating under low pressure, which means our filtration rate is low. So the slower we go in there, the more sodium we're going to lose. So without having to detect anything else, we don't have to detect water levels or anything along that line. All we have to do is detect the presence of sodium. Sodium levels shouldn't be dropping significantly. Well, they should be, but not, not at the level of where they're, they're, they're barely there. So if the sodium levels are below what we would consider a normal value, that's going to tell the kidneys that our filtration rate is too slow. The longer we're going through the kidney tubules, the more time we have to lose sodium. But we don't want that. So the macula densa cells inside of the distal tubule can tell us this. And the last thing is the granular cells themselves are not being stretched. You know, they're gonna, they wrap themselves around the afferent arteriole as it's coming into the glomerula. And if they're not being stretched adequately from the higher pressure blood, the blood coming into the glomerula is at 55. It doesn't slow down to 10 because, until it gets the pushback in Ruder and Bowen's capsule. If the pressure, if, if the pressure is low, the granular cells, which are used to being stretched out, are not going to stretch as much. And that's also going to be a trigger to uh, respond here. So the distal tubule, the distal tubule butts up against the afferent and efferent arteriole. I showed you the diagram the other day, but it looks something like this. If this is your glomerula here. Here comes the afferent arteriole. There and the eastern arterial here, the distal tubule is butted up right here, way it wraps itself around. The macula densa cells are right there. The juxtable, the juxtable cells. Located here and to some extent here. These are the well, mayor, the cells. That really does say the mayor. That's right there. And this is still part of the deeper arterial there. Okay. Now, the, um, the distal tubule is right up in there. And so it can tell the macula densa if our sodium concentrations are too low because the filtration rate is too low. The, um, the, the walls of the uh, afferent arterial and to some extent the efferent arterial have these glomerular cells here which deal with pressure. If the pressure is high or the pressure is low, they act like well, mechanoreceptors are not going to be measuring pressure per se. They're going to be measuring how much you're getting stretched. And that indirectly tells us pressure. You know, if uh, 
you know, if you are, uh, if, if a balloon is being inflated, you know, the, the latex is going to stretch out. So it, uh, you can monitor, you know, how close you are to popping. And you can either, you know, basically inside the balloon, or you can just see how much the, the, the balloon itself is being stretched out, you know. Which is which one is a little more sophisticated, measuring the pressure inside the balloon. Which one is just as efficient? Which, you know, if the balloon gets bigger, you're going to think it's going to pop soon, right? Yeah. You know, who hasn't had a balloon pop? So more. Yeah. So we, that's what the, uh, the, the lamellar cells do. Lamellar cells are mechanoreceptors. They measure stretch. They don't worry about pressure. They measure how much are they getting stretched. And they are going to, when they get stretched or don't get stretched, that's going to trigger the feed. If, for example, if they are not being stretched, release rent. Stretch or no stretch. The glomerular cells right here on either side of the atrium arterial, they're going to, they're going to deal with pressure. We're going to measure the pressure here indirectly uh, 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 by how much they're being stretched. If they're being stretched a lot, then they're not going to release a lot of rent. The reason is because being you know, really stretched out means that there's higher pressure. If they're not being, if they're not stretching out, it means the pressure's low. So then they would release rent. It's the difference between like a balloon that's inflated about the ready to burst or one that you just you know, it's blowing up a little bit. You know, how stretched is it? So the movement will then trigger the uh, angiotensin aldosterone mechanisms. So we get our renin from the juxtaglomerular cells. Now the macula densa, uh, this is a better diagram right here. This is it's a much prettier picture. Here's the macula densa right here. Here are the juxtaglomerular cells all around the afferent arterial to some extent. The efferent arterial here, and, oh, that's, these, are, these are the granular cells here in, in orange and blue around the efferent arterial, but mostly around the afferent arterial. So when they stretch or don't stretch, if they don't stretch, they're gonna release renin. If they do stretch, then they're not gonna release a lot of renin because the pressure's okay. What the uh, macula densa now will tell us, um, the macula densa can also trigger the release of renin. Macula densa is where we monitor the sodium level. Sodium levels are either low, normal, or high in the distal tubule. If the sodium levels are high, it means our filtration rate is bad. It means we haven't had time to pull sodium out. We don't like that. If our filtration rate, if our sodium levels are low, it means our filtration rate is low. So low means uh, slow, high means fast. So we're either going to be uh, coming through too fast with lots of sodium. Lots of sodium in the distal tubule tells us that we've gone all the way through the nephron and we haven't had time to pull out all the sodium we want to. That means we haven't pulled all the water out we want to. If we have low, so low sodium, means our filtration rate is too slow. If everything, if we have normal sodium, then our filtration rate is fine. So, if the macula densa can detect low sodium, it will make the assumption, usually correct, uh, that it's because of uh, low blood pressure. And that will trigger the uh, macula densa to tell the, the lamellar cells to release renin. So here's our, uh, here's our uh, macula densa right here. There's our uh, lamellar cells here. And so we're monitoring sodium levels here. That's what, and that tells us if the sodium level's low, that tells the uh, lamellar cells to release renin. If the pressure's too high, these, are, the, these cells are gonna stretch and we're not gonna release renin if the pressure's too low. They're, they're, gonna, they're not going to stretch their um, pressure's high. They're going to be stretched a lot. If the pressure's low, they're not going to be stretched. If they're not stretched much, they're going to release renin. So the, the, uh, 
see that one of the this, this printed key here deals with the release of Brennan in the hypnosis in the hospital. Well, Brennan in the hypnosis in the hospital, whether it's high or low pressure, and it should be done. The pair cells detect by stretching, or whether it's high or low sodium, it should be detected here in the macula densa. Now, the macula densa, in addition to notifying the regular cells we call the renin angiotensin aldosterone, the macula densa itself will also uh, vasodilate the afferent arterial. So if, our, um, if we have low sodium, which means low pressure, we can increase the pressure by increasing blood flow. So we yeah, sound sort of counterintuitive because when we vasodilate, we tend to think of vasodilation going along with lower with a drop pressure. Okay, yeah. Person vasodilates, the vessel gets larger, more blood goes through, and the, you know, there's less resistance right everybody that's how it's supposed to work. Well, here, if our pressure is too low, we increase the flow going into the glomerulus by dilating the uh, atrium arterial. And that's what happens here. We dilate the eighth, the macula densa will stimulate uh, dil uh, dil uh, uh, dilation of the afferent arterial and vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. So this, uh, let me go back one. Something's low. The afferent arterial dilates, this constricts. So now it's like squeezing a hose. You know, if you have a, if you if you put you know if you put pressure on a on a on a garden hose, you're going to restrict the flow. So you are restricting the ether and arterial by vasoconstricting it. At the same time, you're dilating the ether and arterial. More water, more fluid is coming in. More blood's coming in. You can get out. So it's starting to you know it, it hits the lamellulus and the pressure starts rising. Simply by increasing the, the, the flow of blood coming in and restricting it going out. And so the macula densa does, you know, it's detecting sodium, and that drop in sodium can trigger a whole number of activities. You know, uh, release of renin, you know, uh, vasoconstriction of the afferent, and I'm uh, sorry, vasodilation of the afferent and vasoconstriction of the efferent. So So this, this we have the the kidney these, these uh, using the, the hormones using our hormones here our hormonal control we can use renin angiotensin aldosterone to uh, an increase in blood pressure that takes a little bit of time that the renin angiotensin aldosterone putting in water takes place here we can uh, basically well, we can vasoconstrict or vasodilate the afferent arterial. We can vasoconstrict the ether arterial. There are any number of ways to alter uh, the pressure in the kidney. And the, you know, the key to detecting a lot of it is the presence of sodium in the distal tubule. You know, if the sodium is low, then the, the GFR is low. That's, that's the key. Low sodium, low GFR. High sodium, high GFR, fast GFR. So we want to be right in the middle. So we respond. If we either raise the pressure, we can lower the pressure if we need to. Okay, now we've got our pressure control. We know what the pressure is going in and out of the kidney. Okay, the kidney will have a pressure going in at the bottom and a pressure going into the tubule of 10. We forced all these um, these ions and amino acids and glucose and water uh, into the proximal tubule. How are we going to get it back? And this term here, tubular reabsorption. The uh, remember that the kidney tubule is made up of simple columnar cells. If you remember back to AP1 lab, we looked at. 
These are best I can do at 9.30 in the morning. Okay. These are cuboidal cells. This is the kidney tubule. This is the tubule. And the nephron. Simple. Cuboidal. Cell. This is the lumen. This is the middle of the tubule with filtrate. Outside of this is a capillary right here. Actually, lot. So, whatever is in the lumen, the filtrate, has to pass through this membrane here, this membrane here, and the membrane of the capillary to get back into the blood. This is the tubular reabsorption. So, we have to go. Yeah, the filtrate is coming down from the uh, uh, Bowman's capsule. It's the proximal tubule is made up of the, the, these uh, simple cuboidal cells forming these long tubes that run from the cortex down to the medulla and back up again. And the filtrate's in here, and it has to move water and salt and glucose across this with the first membrane, the second membrane, the third membrane. Remember the case. Here we have a, a simple cuboidal cell. Here's our lumen. Here's our capillary right here. Comes our filter. It has to go across the cell membrane here. It's inside the cell. Whatever is it, whatever is coming in. It has to transverse to go across the cell, out the other side, across the other, other cell membrane, on the other side of the cell. Then it has to go through the membrane of the capillary. It doesn't have to go very far, but it does have to go from the lumen of, of the middle of the, of the kidney tubule across these two membranes. And a lot of it's passive along the system. So water, water has it easy. Water diffuses from the, the lumen through the uh, walls of the, through the, the membranes of the uh, cuboidal cell. Water uses the aquaphorins for the hole for the water. Water simply diffuses you know, from the filtrate into, uh, into the capillary. So we recover the water. Ions have a problem. Because if sodium comes in here, there's, all, there's high sodium out here in the filtrate. So if sodium's going to diffuse in. You have sodium inside the cell. But now you still have high sodium down here. Sodium is not going to diffuse out the other side of the, the cell membrane because there's going to be higher sodium here, higher sodium outside the cell, higher sodium outside the cell membranes, and lower sodium here. The only way to get the sodium across this other membrane is through the sodium potassium pump. So we have to spend energy to pump. The, these ions out because you know, they're not going to diffuse. You know, they're going to diffuse in, they won't come out. Because the concentration of sodium is, is the big one in our bodies. You know, we always have higher sodium outside our cells and inside. Well, here in the lumen with our filtrate, we have high sodium there and it diffuses right into the cell, just like it does all the time. Our bodies are always pumping sodium out. You know, we, we use the sodium potassium pump constantly to maintain the sodium concentration outside of so cells. What do we use sodium for? 
Polarization. Yeah. Depolarization depends on, except for the heart, sodium coming across the cell diffusing in, you know, when the when the sodium channels open up thanks to acetylcholine. But here we don't have that much. We're just we're just diffusing in. We're just diffusing in. We want to get rid of it. Now I don't think the the uh, cuboidal cells are going to depolarize at any time soon. But we still want to get rid of the sodium that's inside the cell. It won't diffuse out. So we have to pump it out. So we filter our entire blood supply every 45 minutes. So we must be doing something right to get the sodium out of the cell, to get potassium out of the cell. We want to get that back in the blood so it can circulate around all the other cells. You know, I said this the other day, well, only about 1% or so of the filtrate that's, uh, that goes through the glomerulus is uh, become purine. You know, for every 120 mils of filtrate you generate, we recover 99% of it, about 119 mils, if you're doing the math. If we didn't reabsorb that 99%, we would dry up uh, within about within an hour. You know those uh, those, those scarecrows you see that pop up in all the the craft stores around uh, around October. We'd look like that. You know, we wouldn't have to wear the little hats, but we'd still look like that. So, okay. So we to get that get everything back because we don't want to lose. Uh, all of our plasma in 45 minutes. To get everything back, we have to get the water back. We have to get most of the sodium back. We have to get all the glucose back. Uh, we have to move things across two, you know, three membrane to get there. Because we're inside, we're inside the lumen now. We want to get the water and salt, the glucose and the amino acids. Everything has to move back into the blood. The only thing we're going to leave behind are the waste products. We want to recover everything else. We want to recover all the good stuff. So we have to get through, as it says, the luminal membrane of the tubule cell. That's a nice way of saying the inside membrane. This is the lumen. Lumin the luminal membrane is the inside membrane. Okay. The um, azolateral membrane is the outside membrane. And then, of course, the epithelial the capillary has its own cell outside cell layer over here. So again, we only have to go through three cell membranes to get in and out. We're already in the tubule. The driver is going to be sodium. There, uh, we're going to have the highest concentrations of uh, uh, sodium in the filtrate. So we're going to have high sodium. In here, I tell you right in here, we're going to have sodium. Yep. My sodium here, that's going to diffuse into these cells. That's going to be a passive process. There's no energy involved. You know, we have lots of sodium in the, in the plasma. And uh, it's going to go into the lumen as filtrate. It's still transparent. Uh, there's no coloring, you know, no, doesn't look like urine or anything yet. So the high sodium inside the filtrate in the lumen is going to diffuse passively into the cells that make up the tubule. But once they're inside, once it's inside the cells, it can't get out passively because we have a high concentration of sodium now. But not inside what's outside. You know, we have very high sodium outside our bodies, outside our cells in the plasma and the interstitial fluid. Well, we're not going to, you know, we have, we can't go downstream. You know, whatever the sodium concentration is inside the cell it is still less than what's out here. So we can't just passively diffuse like we got in. So, Sodium going into the cell passively, it can't get out passively. So we have to use the sodium potassium pump 
to get the sodium out. Now this is going to be key because this is going to be the driver for pushing water and glucose out too. It's all about the sodium. Moving the, you know, reabsorbing the sodium is active transport. The sodium potassium pump is the key here. Uh, cells spend about 40% of their overall energy budget on the sodium potassium pump. And one of the big places we, where our bodies use uh, the sodium potassium pump is going to be right here. We use it in all the cells. This is a big one here because the only way we can get you know, sodium will passively flood these cells. The only way we can get it out is to pump it out. Doesn't matter how high the concentration is inside the, the kidney tubule cell, it's going to be higher in the interstitial fluid outside. And so we won't diffuse passively. We pump it out. But once we pump it out in, into the interstitial fluid, we will we can then move into the capillaries. We can move into the capillaries again because we'll have a higher concentration of sodium in the interstitial fluid. Then in the capillaries, we will move uh, directly into uh, the uh, capillary itself because we will have you know, capillaries to lower less water and more sodium than the interstitial fluid does. The interstitial fluid has more water and less sodium. So we're going to do simple osmosis will drive us. Uh, into the blood. Okay, that's a long way of saying the whole thing. Sodium's key. It comes into the cell the, of the tubule passively. It has to get pumped out. And when it gets pumped out, it's going to run along. It's going to piggyback uh, glucose. It's going to piggyback water. It's going to piggyback uh, the other ions. So here we see a much cleaner drawing line. Here's our filtrate up here. Water is going to come across the membrane passively. Uh, we're going to have our solutes are going to have to come across, like sodium is going to have to come across uh, with active transport. So it only has to go from the filtrate through the kidney uh, tubule cells into the interstitial cells into the capillary. And if we're looking at sodium, we pump it out. We bring potassium back in. Remember, sodium and potassium are antagonists. So they, if one goes out, the other comes in, just like in the cells of the sodium potassium pump. So here comes our filtrate with sodium. Sodium is leaving. Sodium is absorbed back into the kidney tubules. If you remember uh, that the sodium potassium pump is an antiport as far as putting sodium out and passing back into the cell, it also works by driving or enabling glucose to travel with it. In secondary active transport, we create an environment where as we reabsorb sodium, we're reabsorbing glucose at the same time. So when the sodium comes into the uh, cell, when the sodium comes in here, this initial entry in the cell of the glucose that's in the filtrate will go along with it. Sodium alters the, the sodium channel alters its shape to allow a glucose molecule to land at the same site. So when sodium enters passively, glucose will come along. So now we've got sodium and glucose coming together. Water is moving along with it. So now we've got sodium, glucose, and water. Uh, and so secondary active transport allows us to bring in. The uh, yeah, as we as we pump the sodium out, more sodium comes in. More sodium is dragging in glucose. More sodium is dragging in water. More sodium is dragging in hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions and fluorine. And so we are passively driving the movement of just by using the active transport for sodium. We are passively driving the movement of the water. And we're driving and bringing in glucose and uh, amino acids and anything else we want to get. So, and it looks something like this. Here we see primary active transport takes place for sodium and potassium. 
But secondary active transport is bringing in glucose, the amino acids, ions, vitamins. Uh, water is going across passively. Chlorine is going across passively. Uh, you know, we uh, this is that that uh, sodium and glucose uh, port. You know, it's it's uh, you know it's passive. It's secondary active transport for glucose, and it can be rested with sodium. And so we're recovering. It all goes out here to the interfacial fluid, and then it moves through diffusion or osmosis into uh, the capillary. So we don't lose 99% of the, of the water. We don't lose any of the glucose, at least we couldn't. We don't lose most of our sodium. Uh, we recover all these things through this, this reabsorption here in mostly in the proximal convoluted tubule. Glucose gets recovered in the proximal convoluted tubule. That's where, that's where we get it. That's where we recover it, right in that portion there. We get about 60% of the sodium. We get about 60% of the water. We continue recovering salt and water all the way through the uh, nephron, even into the collecting duct. So, now things that do not get reabsorbed, if there's no mechanism for it, if it's a large molecule, uh, that we don't have a way to, to recover it. If it is uh, water soluble instead of fat soluble, if it is, um, there are no mechanisms, you know, no uh, symports uh, or uh, protein channels or, or uh, carrier proteins to let it come through. The uh, urea, creatinine, and uric acid are large molecules and they get trapped here. Those are all nitrogenous waste. And they break down a protein. We want to keep them in the filtrate, so we don't want them to be reabsorbed. We are too large. They don't have any mechanism to get across. Uh, so, and we, so we, they're trapped there. And, and this is what's important about our filtration rate. If our filtration rate is too fast, then we may not get all the good stuff out that we want. If our filtration rate is too slow, then these waste products, the urea and the uric acid, the creatinine, may have time to be reabsorbed. So an individual in kidney failure, whose kidneys are functioning very poorly, will have a low filtration rate, and it will give their kidneys time to recover the waste product that they should be getting rid of. So it's now the kidneys are failing because they are letting the toxins back into the blood. In the proximal tubule, we get um, all the glucose, uh, most of the sodium, uh, uh, most of the water, 60% or so, uh, the, uh, the potassiums, I mean, the, the, the calciums, the magnesiums, the chlorines. These anions and cations are going to get reabsorbed here in the proximal tubule. Uh, anything that's lipid soluble that we want to retain, and any of the small proteins. Lupapenly will re basically recover water on its descending loop and sodium on the ascending loop. The distal tubule then will recover more water. Uh, it will recover calcium if the parathyroid hormone tells it to. But parathyroid hormone only if the prime controller of calcium levels in our blood will tell the kidney to recover calcium, and it recovers calcium in the distal tubule. The sodium, if aldosterone is active, sodium will get recovered in the distal tubule along with water. Uh, potassium will get recovered in the distal tubule if there is no aldosterone. And where sodium and potassium work against each other, they're antagonists. They don't work through the same thing that works against each other. So, so but aldosterone indirectly, indirectly, not indirectly, will regulate calcium levels. This is, if aldosterone is low, we're not going to retain sodium, but we will retain potassium. If potassium levels are high, then uh, we our sodium levels are low. So, if we retain sodium, we kick out potassium. If we have a lot of potassium, we're kicking out sodium. Whatever they're 
going to be in opposite concentrations all the time. So uh, calcium, sodium, hydrogen ions, potassium, water get absorbed into the distal tubule because if you re recover sodium, you're going to recover water. The collecting duct goes after water. The collecting duct is where anti-diuretic hormone is going to act. So we have three distinct areas of uh, reabsorption. And then it's secretion. If we are secreting uh, certain uh, uh, chemicals uh, uh, throughout. In the distal tubule, for example, if we are just removing a and P has an effect on the kidneys. A and P will get released if the atria are stretched. The upper chambers of the heart, which you're going to see in up close detail today, you know, the atria are the receiving chamber. If they are receiving too much blood, or a higher level of blood than they used to, the blood volume in the atria is greater than normal. The atria are going to stretch. When they stretch, they release A and P. And so, their response is to release a atrial natriuretic peptide, a localized hormone, which will reduce the sodium in the blood. It will reduce the amount of sodium, which reduces the amount of water, so that it interferes with the renin aldo angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Because if we have less, less sodium, we're retaining less water. If we're retaining less water, it reduces our blood volume. Because water, all water ends up in this way. So we reduce sodium, we reduce blood volume by reducing water. If we reduce blood volume, we lower blood pressure. So AMP is a short term fix to lower blood pressure by interfering with the recovery of sodium and lowering blood, uh, decreasing blood volume to lower blood pressure. And what does that have to do with the kidneys? Well, it uh, helps us not to recover as much sodium in the tubule. It can improve the sodium recovery in the um, proximal tubule, the distal tubule, and the loop of Henle. So we don't recover as much sodium, and which means we don't recover as much water because water will follow the salt. So, so the, the first thing we do is Lots of recovery of sodium in the kidneys. The second thing it'll do is it will interfere with angiotensin II formation. But again, this is a great little hypertensive treatment, except it's a very short term. And it increases the filtration rate. So ANP has a direct and an indirect, a direct and indirect effect on uh, our blood pressure by acting on the kidneys. And we don't recover as much sodium, meaning we don't recover as much water, which keeps our blood volume lower and our blood pressure lower. And we uh, increase the GFR so that we don't have time to recover all the water. It's a short-term fix. It is not. This is not a way our bodies work to regulate our long-term blood pressure issues. Now, I mentioned this a couple of times, similar secretion, getting rid of the products that we don't like. There's large chemicals in food, food additives, uh, coloring agents, medicines that we take, uh, chemicals embedded automatically in, in the food, like the catecholamine. These are all large molecules that can't go through the, the, the glomerulus. They're too big. They're in the plasma because everything we drink ends up in our plasma. They're too big. And so 
they go through the lamellulus, they come out the other side in the efferent arterial, and they go into the capillaries. The capillaries now will secrete these molecules, actively secrete them into the proximal tubule, the distal tubule, and the loop penalty. If we're going to get rid of um, things we don't want, perhaps we're too much potassium, perhaps you know food agents, you know, coloring agents, you know medications. You know the, the dosage of medications is predicated on how much will get through your liver and how much will get through your kidney. You know, how much do we reabsorb in the kidneys? How much do we do the weight? We make it a dose like you know, a thousand milligrams. are not functional enough or fully you know, they're, they're not big enough to process that large dose of uh, a tunnel. Whereas an adult kidney, an adult liver is just fine with it. The dosage is you know, we can we take two Tylenol tablets all the time. Now another term to understand here, and you're going to hear more about this in um, is um, osmolality. We, we tend to get that con sometimes confused with osmolarity. That's okay if you do. What we, osmolality, which is hard to say too, is based on how many solute particles you find in a liter of water. So if I, I don't know, take 100 grams of salt and dump it into a liter of water, and I have 100 grams worth of sodium solute particles in solution. You know, uh, this, the osmolality is the driver for osmosis. If I have 100 grams of salt in a liter of water, I have a 10% salt solution. If I have an artificial cereal, some of it's 10% salt solution, it's going to be a deeper 100% water. Osmosis will dictate 10 water over time. Yeah. 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 Well, that gives me a 10% salt solution. That means a 10% salt and 90% water. So, you have an artificial cell that's 90% water floating in the beaker on 100% water. And you have a cell membrane in between. Which side of the cell membrane has the higher water concentration? The outside. What's in the beaker? It's 100% water. 100% is better than 90%. Okay, I don't want to do math in public. Now, the concentration of the solute particles is a reflection of which way osmosis will go. You, know, you could take that 10% salt solution and put an artificial cell inside that that was 50% salt. Then the 10% salt solution has a higher water concentration. Because 90% is greater than 50%. Water will go into the cell. It doesn't matter. It's the amount of solute particles inside a liter of water will dictate which way water is going to go through osmosis. We try to maintain a salt concentration in our bodies of about 300 milliosmol. And we, we measure our fluids in milliosmoles. It has to do with... Uh, which way, you know, what's the water concentration, what's the salt concentration, and it's all, we always measure salt. That's the dominant ion. 
what is the what is the salt concentration in our bodies? And the magic number for us is about 300 milliosmoles. And so we try to recover as much sodium as we can and recover as much water as we can. And this, milli, this 300 milliosmol is mostly formed by sodium. Nearly all, nearly 90%, 95% of these, the osmotic concentration of the fluids in our body is based on the sodium concentration. And it doesn't take much of a fluctuation in the uh, osmotic concentration to make us thirsty or to satisfy our thirst. It doesn't take much at all. Now, we the way that we maintain this 300 milliosmoles is based on the presence of salt and water. We try to recover as much water as we can from the kidney tube. We recover 60% of the salt and a fair amount of water in the proximal tubule. The loop of Henle is going to recover a great deal of water on its descending side and a great deal of sodium on its ascending side because the only way to get water to be retained or to release is based on the sodium concentration system. You need to remember, the thing to remember, water follows salt. Water will always follow the salt. If you have high sodium, you're going to have high water. If you're retaining lots of sodium, you're going to retain water. If you uh, have low sodium, you're going to have low water. And of course, that may be a good thing. If you have low sodium, you're going to have low water. You're going to have low blood volume. You'll have low blood pressure. Yeah. Why do we tell hypertensive patients not to eat a lot of salt? Because if they eat salt, they'll retain water, which will raise their blood volume, which raises their blood pressure. So it. It is sort of like, like dominoes falling over here. So the descending loop of Henley has what we call a counter current mechanism. The loop of the descends is, is releasing water to be recovered by the capillary, and the ascending side is not releasing water, but instead releasing sodium. So we have. Two different mechanisms, one side releasing water, one side releasing sodium. And so we call it a countercurrent mechanism. Looks something like this. The descending side is permeable to water. Water goes out. The, the, the other side, the ascending side, is impermeable to water, but permeable to salt. And so as the water leaves on the, on the descending side, the sodium will follow on the ascending side because you know, it, it is, you know, the water, there is already salt. Let's see if I can say this carefully. This water out here that's going out is going out into a salty environment. Water is going to the sodium over here. Where did the sodium come from? It can never reach equilibrium, but it's trying to do that. And so, um, on the um, here's our blood flow. Here is our uh, water is leading. From the descending loop, we're going to be leaving here, and we are recovering sodium at this point. We're leaving the water that's coming out here. This is the very salty environment, and we're going to be basically some that we can't get the water out, but we're going to get sodium, which is being stored in the blood vessel. This is a very confusing topic, so don't, you know. What do you need to remember about the loop of Henley? Countercurrent mechanism. Number one answer is you know, because the way they work. Sodium on uh, water out on the descending side and sodium out on the ascending side. The whole purpose, though, is that we want to create a gradient, a high salt concentration. The whole purpose of the countercurrent mechanism is to try to recover water. 
Now, so we get to the top, we, we, we processed our filtrate to the proximal tube, and we got all the glucose out, and we got the salt and all the water out, all the other good things. And we've gone through the lids of Henley and we've sucked out more water on the descending side, we've sucked out more salt on the ascending side, and at the distal tubule up there at the top, our osmotic concentration is only about 100. And if nothing else happened, it would be uh, transparent and uh, uh, almost clear, maybe even clear uh, at that point, because it would be an ultra dilute concentrated urine, uh, un not an unconcentrated urine. And if, nothing else, if there's nothing else going on, then the super dilute, the 100 milliosmol urine, there where it says DCT, would go into the collecting duct, and this is what you would be producing is the pale urine. Because it doesn't take into account any action by uh, the uh, antidiuretic hormone. On the other hand, if we do have antidiuretic hormone present, then we're, instead of producing a dilute urine, of 100 milliosmoles, we may produce something that's bright yellow, uh, full of sodium uh, and less water that is at 1200 milliosmoles. So you know, where we finally produce the urine is, and, and the concentration of the urine is dictated by the presence of antidiuretic hormone because that only acts on the collecting duct. So, our dilute urine formed uh, at coming out of the loop of Henle, going into the distal tubule. Uh, if nothing else happens to it, if we don't recover any more sodium or recover any more water, we're going to pee out a, a very transparent stream. If, on the other hand, you know the um, if, you know, this this occurs when we interfere with the presence of antidiuretic hormone. One of the consequences of, of drinking um, generously, I'll say generously, uh, is you take in more alcohol. Alcohol interferes with the release of antidiuretic hormone. The consequences of drinking, you know, generously is that uh, you have to pee more frequently. You're blocking the antidiuretic hormone, so you have to reduce, produce more and more urine. It's, it's, our kidneys are still functioning. The kidneys are still filtering but you're not recovering all the water. So you're going to be peeing a lot and it's going to be transparent, it's going to be diluted. And as, as, it, as this continues, then uh, you become dehydrated because you're losing all this extra water. Now, on the other hand, if antidiuretic hormone is present, then we don't pee. It, as I say, it, it's diuresis, the need to urinate. The... Um, in antidiuretic hormone, we recover 99% of what goes into the collecting, goes to the collecting duct. So we take that 100 milliosmol dilute urine and we recover 99% of the water and the sodium inside of it. And then we produce a concentrated urine. So the collecting duct is receiving this dilute filtrate that has come through the loop of Henley we have recovered a great deal of water in the filtrate. Uh, or we, we recovered a great deal of sodium. The filtrate is very dilute. And if we lose that, we're losing a, a, a lot of water. So antidiuretic hormone normally activa is activated and tells us to recover the water in the collecting duct. So antidiuretic hormone, it's going to do this. ADH, its proper name is vasopressin. It is also a vasoconstrictor. But here we see uh, if antidiuretic hormone is present, we will take that dilute urine of 100 and concentrate it down to 1,200. No, no vasopressin, no ADH. We will use a urine of about 100 milliosmoles. And that's what we see coming out. You know, the more that we interfere with uh, the release of ADH, the more dilute our urine is going to be. And if we continue that process over a period of time, we'll probably become dehydrated.
Now, the diuretics do have their place. DDH is anti-diuretic, so our body uses to maintain uh, our normal osmotic concentration. However, uh, it, uh, diuretics do have a purpose. Uh, a diuretic will cause your patient to need to urinate to get rid of extra fluids. Uh, they uh, things that are act as diuretics are chemicals that don't get reabsorbed. Things that uh, uh, interfere with the kidney tubules themselves, or things that interfere with reabsorption of sodium, because sodium is also key in controlling water. So, two different types of diuretics. Alcohol. We've mentioned that a lot. Alcohol interferes with the release of anti-diuretic hormones from the pituitary. The more alcohol you're taking, drinks the more likely they're going to have to urinate because they're blocking the release of their anti-diuretic hormones. Caffeine works differently. You drink a lot of coffee, you drink a lot of tea, you drink even a Coke. Coke is very high in caffeine. It will interfere with uh, the recovery of sodium. So no sodium means that no water follows the sodium. The water stays in the filtrate. And so the more caffeine you, you take in, the, the greater the need you are to urinate and lose uh, lose excessive amounts of water. Uh, if we have high blood glucose, this is why patients with diabetes have to eat all the time. The glucose levels in the filtrate aren't being reabsorbed. You know, they, they, you're not using the glucose clear because you don't have the insulin or you have defective insulin. And so the glucose, glucose molecules are in solution and they are automatically uh, sucking water out of the capillaries. And so a person that has uncontrolled diabetes uh, is going to be retaining lots of glucose in their plasma. The plasma, even when it becomes filtered, it's going to have high size, you know, high number of glucose particles acting as a solute, and it's not going to have less solute particles, more water. Water's going to leave the capillary to go into the kidney tube and the left. So the drivers are causing increased urination uh, in your diabetic patient is because of the high level of glucose particles uh, in their in their filtrate. Because we're not glucose isn't going into the cells like it should. So we also can block the uh, Symports, you know, sodium in, glucose in, things like that. Uh, two very common antidiuretic drugs, Lasix and uh, Diaril, both are going to interfere with the sodium symport, you know, sodium in, glucose in, for secondary active transport, for example. So, but there are times that when we want to use a diuretic, a patient's retaining too much fluid, we want to get rid of that fluid. We want to give them a, a medication to, uh, cause them to release more water. Because they've been retaining fluids for whatever is congestive heart failure is a good example. Your diuretic is going to help them get rid of that. And that is the end of the urinary system. Questions on any of this? Okay. Well, I think we need to take a break at that point. So let me come out of this and we will pick up in about 10 minutes and we'll start fluid and electrolytes. So.
For the uh, lab test? No, this was for lab check. Oh, no, you're not going to find it. Yes, you did. So, this is the, that is strictly for the lab. This is for the lab? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thinking of how to start with electrolytes, it does. Uh, I must say that uh, the urinary system and fluid and electrolytes is probably the least exciting that you'll encounter. So, uh, so that's about the best I can say. So, okay, let's go into fluid and electrolytes. And yeah. it's not screen sharing now, so too much. much. Okay, fluid and electrolytes. The important thing about fluid and electrolytes is the plasma levels, interstitial fluid levels, sodium levels, potassium levels in the body. And there is no faster way to kill your patient than to get their fluid and electrolytes out of balance. This is, you know, between fluid and electrolytes and their acid base levels. Uh, once they, once you start trying to correct problems that your patient has and, and they're not working, your patient is literally circling the drain at that point because it's very hard to recover from electrolyte, fluid and electrolyte issues and uh, acid base issues. So it, while this is sound, this will be hopefully not too tedious, it is very important material. I have had many, many nursing students come back and tell me that they were so glad that I uh, went over this material because this will come back again and again in uh, the healthcare program, if, you know, in your, in your advanced class. So in much greater detail than we're going to go over here. So it it helps, and you'll get a, you'll you'll gain a greater appreciation of it as you go on. So okay. In our bodies, we have two water compartments, two fluids. We have what's known as the intracellular compartment and the extracellular compartment. Cellular is what's inside our cells. Our cells are squishy. They're full of water, or it's sort of goopy, inside of inside of plastic, or it's mostly water. And the extracellular fluid is what's outside the cell. So that's all the plasma. That's the interstitial fluid. The plasma contains a large portion of is is mostly water. The interstitial fluid is mostly water. The plasma leaks out through the openings in the uh, blood vessel walls and becomes interstitial fluid, surrounds all of our cells, exchanges water with the cells, then gets recovered by the lymphatic system, and then is brought back to the blood again. And so we we, re, uh, we recirculate, recirculate this water from plasma to interstitial fluid, sometimes into the cells, sometimes not. 
into the, the lymphatic fluid and back to the plasma. So the extracellular fluid is both, again, it's both plasma and interstitial fluid. And we also have small clusters of extracellular fluid in our eyeballs um, uh, surround in, in the fluid that surrounds our brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, um, the fluid in our joints, the synovial fluids, uh, all of the fluid that lines the serous membranes in our bodies count as part of this extracellular fluid, and the fluid in our, in our stomach, the, the fluids that our uh, gastric pits secrete. So, okay. So graphically, here's what it looks like. 40% of our body weight uh, is intracellular fluid, about 25 liters. 25 liters of water are in our body. Remember, we're about 70 to 80% water anyway. So about uh, 25 liters of water is within our cells. We have about 12 liters in the interstitial fluid, and we have about three liters in our plasma. So we that is the makeup here. So we are mostly, we have a interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid, plasma, you know, all this stuff. The plasma, all this stuff, we have interstitial fluid, and it's the rest of the part of it, and that's the rest of it. And it's the rest of the part of it. And it's staying some of the water with the cells. The um, problems with water, yeah, get this right out of the way right away, we have two key problems with water not enough water or too much water. If we're dehydrated, the dehydration is going to affect the plasma, which affects the interstitial fluid. We lose body fluid. We sweat excessively. excessively. We don't drink anything. We're thirsty. We're being deprived of water. We have a high fever, releasing uh, water when we release heat. Okay, so. Uh, if we become dehydrated, we're first losing it from the extracellular fluid. We're losing it from the plasma. We're losing it from the interstitial fluid. Well, that interstitial fluid um, is what surrounds this is the cell. It surrounds the cell. Now, when we lose water, <clears throat> when we lose water, we don't usually lose a lot of sodium. The sodium stays behind. You know, if, um, I've done this before. Yeah. You may have seen this if, if, if you have any grades you want, but I take a beaker full of water, and you add 100 grams of that to my imaginary beaker with my 10% salt solution. I get a liter of water, I've got 100 grams of salt in here, and at some point in time, the water will evaporate. The salt stays the time. At the end of the semester, Usually, I'm going to be through a whole bunch of salt crystals in the bottom, and then water. We didn't lose any of the salt. Our bodies are the same way. We essentially, when we lose water, most of the salt stays behind. So, the salt concentration, if we lose water in our plasma and our interstitial fluid, the salt concentration left over is rising. So we're normally about 0.9% sodium chloride in our plasma. But if we lose water, that concentration goes up. We're losing the water, but not the salt. So if our interstitial fluid gets saltier, it's going to have a higher salt concentration than what's inside the cell. And that's going to cause the cells then to give up water. Because, you know, it's simple osmosis. If we have more salt in solution outside the cell, if there's less water, the cell's going to give up water. It's going to have to keep delivering to try and fix that. And the cells are going to shrink. And the cells in our bodies don't like to shrink. Especially the brain cells. Uh, nerve system cells do not like shrinking. So dehydration affects us first by losing water from the plasma and from the interstitial fluid, and then by causing our cells to shrink. Because osmosis is going to drive water back out the interstitial fluid simply because. The more water we lose from our fluids, you know, plasma interstitial, the saltier it's going to become because the salt is left behind. So salt's key. Now, if we uh, have a condition of hypotonic hydration, where we drink too much water, 
in an excessive amount of water. That's also not a good thing because now we are diluting. If we drink a lot of water, where does it go? It goes into our plasma. Everything we drink ends up in our plasma. The water goes into our plasma, can't live in our inner tissue, so we dilute the salt that's found in the plasma. We dilute the salt that's in the skin fluid. And now we have a lower osmotic pressure here. We have less salt around the, the outside of the cell, meaning we have more water. Osmosis always goes from the higher water concentration to the lower water concentration. If we have more water out here now, it's going to force water into the cells, and the cells are going to swell up. And they don't like that either. They don't like that either, because if they swell up, uh, it's possible that they could rupture. You know, we used to uh, do this uh, in the past where we would take a drop of blood and put it under a microscope slide, the depth of the screen, and then you can drop up the small water to it, and then you can see the red cells, and see the red drop of the still water to it. So I think you just have to keep seeing it, even though this is still water, and more water off of 100% water, the red cells are only 99.1% water. I don't want to get the new cells. That was a monster. They, they lice instantly. And uh, they burst because they've sucked up too much water. One of the reasons why we generally, usually, don't always uh, administer a 100% uh, distilled water IV. There are some exceptions, but we'll go into those later. Yeah. So, too much water. Just like everything else in our body, too much or too little causes a problem. Too much water in the interstitial fluid, which was plasma, now it's interstitial fluid, um, will cause uh, will cause that water to go into the cells. The cells can swell. The cells can burst. So, two key problems: not enough water causing dehydration, or too much water ca causing what's known as hypotonic hydration. So. Now, water we know is the universal solvent because it dissolves pretty much everything. Within our fluids, uh, we have solutes. And we use water as our solvent. We have a variety of solutes. Solutes are either going to be electrolytes, uh, which include all of the sodium, the potassium. The hydrogen ions, the uh, bicarbonate ions, uh, proteins, these are all considered to be electrolytes. Electrolytes can uh, contain a charge. They contain an electrical charge. A sodium ion, positively charged sodium. Uh, a negative chlorine, chlorine cation, uh, anion. Uh, positive potassium. And we'll talk to the calcium. These carry have charges on them because they're either they either have gained or lost an electron. So these electrolytes can have a have the ability to carry a current. They also have the ability to draw more water than a non-electrolyte. A non-electrolyte are bound uh, solute particles like glucose. Glucose has no charge on it. Uh, carbon dioxide has no charge on it. It's not an electrolyte. Uh, the, the fats in the, the uh, triglycerides have no charge, even when they split into the uh, glycerol and the fatty acids. They don't have a charge, so they don't they they don't draw water, you know, through osmosis as well as the electrolytes do. So our fluids, the solute particles in our fluids, are either going to be Solutes that are like they are either electrolytes with charge or non electrolytes with no charge. An electrolyte will always break apart into uh, ions when you put it in water. Sodium chloride, typical plain old table salt. Uh, when the water will disassociate very quickly into a positive sodium ion 
and a negative chlorine ion. Remember that sodium chloride is held together by ionic bonds. And ionic bonds are pretty weak, and they break apart very easily when uh, exposed to water. The positive, ox positive hydrogens and the negative oxygen rip apart the positive and negative charge sodiums and chlorines. And so you you have this this charge. You know, sodium chloride gives you sodium and chlorine with uh, you have the uh, electric the electric charge, the negative charge on the chlorine, and the positive charge on the sodium. And so each part, uh, if we take sodium chloride, sodium chloride has a very powerful osmotic uh, concentration. So sodium chloride gives you two particles, two side particles. Sodium chloride breaks apart into two particles, and each one of them has an osmotic effect. Now here we see uh, magnesium chlor uh, chloride has magnesium and two chlorines. When that goes into water, it separates out, it, it uh, disassociates and gives you three particles. The magnesium chloride has a greater osmotic effect than just regular plain old salt. And glucose, except glucose, it can be, it has no charge on it. And glucose doesn't have as much osmotic draw as these electrolytes do. Bottom line, sodium is the key. Sodium is the primary electrolyte in our life that we depend on to move in the water. Nearly all of the electrolyte concentrations in the plasma is sodium. Sodium is, is looking at the water to move in the water. Chlorine chlorine is water. Chlorine doesn't have a whole lot of effect on anything other than being the other half of sodium chloride. So but the concentration of sodium is going to be the driver for moving water from one side of a membrane to another. Yeah, high sodium or low sodium, those are going to be the drivers to move water back and forth here. When we deal with electrolytes, we're using a term known as milliequivalence per liter. That's the concentration of the electrolyte. Uh, how many charges in a liter of solution? You know, so, and if you want to know what the milli equipment per liter is, it is the concentration of the ion in milligrams per liter divided by the, the atomic weight of the ion multiplied by the number of electrical charges on one ion. Now, we don't need to, you know, uh, one milli equivalent is equal to one milli osmol. Okay, that's a little easier to remember. So, it would be unlikely that you would be challenged in a healthcare setting to do the calculations on the milliequivalents and milliosmoles. However, it is important to know that a milliequivalent is equal to a milliosmol. Back to that in a minute. Now, every fluid compartment in our body is going to have a mixture of water and sodium. Uh, it's going to have potassium and it's going to have chlorine present. Uh, sodium is the number one cation in our bodies. It is found primarily in the plasma and the interstitial fluid. Chlorine is the primary anion found in our uh, plasma and interstitial fluid. Chlorine doesn't have much of the it. When you go inside the cell, however, potassium is key. Potassium inside, so if outside the cell, the primary electrolyte is sodium, it is the chief cation, the, the positively charged ion. Inside the cell, it's potassium. Potassium is the chief cation. Potassium is the driver inside the cell. So the driver outside the cell is sodium the driver inside the cell, potassium. Sodium and potassium and sort of her goes in the past have a role to play in depolarization and repolarization, things like that. Um, phosphate is the primary anion inside the cells. Phosphate has a little more to do than fluorine, but not by much. The sodium and potassium concentrations 
are they're not antagonistic to each other, but they are opposite of each other. Uh, they are going to have, we're generally going to have high sodiums outside our cells and high potassiums inside the cells. If we look at this little chart here, we can see where these concentrations are found. For example, in the very first uh, column or bar there, uh, we find sodium high in our plasma, high in our interstitial fluid. Those are the red and blues, and very low in the intracellular fluid. Now we know that sodium is going to leak in. It just does, but it gets pumped back out. So we know that sodium is high in plasma, high in the interstitial fluid, very low in the intracellular fluid. We go to the next uh, bar, and we have very low sodium. I'm sorry, we have potassium. Very high potassium almost the same level as the sodium inside the cells, and we know that. We've, we've seen that since AP1. We always have high sodium outside the cell and we have potassium on the inside. Sodium is always leaking in, potassium is always leaking out. That's what the sodium potassium pump has to fix. Calcium. Calcium is higher inside the cell. Bicarbonate, higher outside the cell in the interstitial fluid and the plasma and inside. Chlorine, high outside, low inside. Phosphate, low outside, high inside. And then the organic, uh, the acids and the proteins, you know, sort of watching there too. So the big ones, so these two here, the sodium and potassium are, are going to be the keys. Now, the cell and the plasma and the interstitial fluid are going to exchange ions all the time. Sodium is leaking into the cell. The cell pumps it back out. Potassium leaks out of the cell. Cells pump it back in. Water can go back and forth. You know, it's not like the cell is isolated uh, from uh, the outside. There's going to be a, a lot of exchange of water going into the cell and out of the cell. The cells have to maintain a constant uh, solute concentration that matches the outside. So that we don't, you know, we don't want to lose water to the outside. We don't want to gain water to the outside. It doesn't matter what the particles are. It doesn't matter if it's sodium outside and potassium inside, as long as the concentrations match. But it's the concentration of the particles that drives which way water goes. So as long as they're equivalent, you're not going to have, you can move all the water you want, but you're not going to see one side suddenly swelling up and the other side or, or shrinking. Key phrase here. The connection, the connection between the internal and external environments, meaning the, the link between the water that is extracellular outside the cells and the water that's intracellular is the plasma. Plasma is the link between both of these compartments. The plasma is going to leak out of the tissue, out of the vessels, become interstitial fluid, it will circulate around all the cells. Water may leave the uh, interstitial fluid and go into the cell. Water may leave the cell and go back into interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid will always end up, after passing through the lymphatic system, it will always end up back in the plasma. So plasma is the link. Plasma is the key here. This is, this is an important point. I can't emphasize this point enough about plasma. It's the only fluid that circulates among all the compartments. You might want to make a, a note or a star on that. So the, the osmotic concentration in our body tends to stay at 300 million osmoles. That is what we consider normal. 300 million osmoles is going to be based on concentration of solid particles inside the cell 
and alpha itself. As long as they stay in balance, then we'll work at it. Any fluctuations are going to be very quickly corrected, and we will fluctuate constantly. And we will go up and down, up and down, but collectively over a 24 hour period, we maintain around 300 milliamps of concentration. Because if our concentration, if our osmotic concentration goes up, water will move. If we get too salty on the outside and in the interstitial fluid, water will leave the cells. If we become dilute, if we have less salt on the outside because we're more diluted, water will go into the cells. So we will be correcting all the time to try and maintain this 300 milliosmol concentration. So how much water are we talking about? Well, um, our water intake and our water output uh, should be balanced at about 2,500 mils, two and a half liters a day. Water coming in, and equal water coming out. Uh, we drink, we get about 60% of our water by what we drink. Uh, we have a food, all of our food uh, contains about 30% water. Uh, we generate our own water. We do cellular respiration. I mean, that's kind of thing. We take the oxygen molecule, we split it in half, and we use that to make. Never mind. I, I don't want to. I don't want to get down that pathway. No. Uh, we well, we make a lot of water when it's cellular respiration, and that gives us about ten percent. So sixty percent is what we take in. You know, the uh, the old wives' tale about drinking eight glasses of water a day. To stay healthy, and then my first question is always, "Well, what size glass? You know, a little glass, a big glass. You know, cold water or tap water. You know, um, you know just like how do you, you know, how do you quantify eight glasses of water a day? There is no quantification, so that's just we just sort of park that off to the side. All we know is that we need about we our bodies need two and a half liters a day." Uh, uh, Two thirds of that is going to come from what we drink, from our coffee, from our tea, from uh, whatever, from a bottle of water. Maybe you've got a bottle of water right there. Uh, and you've got uh, some kind of uh, what, What's your? You've got water and you've got Gatorade and you've got something else, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, look. So, I think we have that. got my coffee. So we're all taking in fluids in some way, but we're also getting fluids from our food. Uh, depending on what kind of food items we eat, they can be very high in water. Uh, plants and fruits and vegetables have a very high water content. So we're going to get 30% there. There's water in um, you know, in the in the protein-based foods like like meat and fish and chicken and stuff. And yes. How do we calculate that if we do something that high well, you're going to get it complicated in some way because if you drink a lot of coffee and you have to urinate, you'll be able to drink a lot more later on. So you'll be thirsty. So, uh, and you're, you know, when you get thirsty, you're one of the first things you can detect is your mouth is getting dry. So you know, you're, you've got a good in your, uh, you, you have uh, uh, caffeine is coming to the feet more frequently. And so your water constant water, your body water drops and saltier. It only takes a little bit of a change for salt concentration to make you thirsty if you have to replace the water with food. So it's, 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 you're not getting a free ride from the cost. Because you're going to lose the water you take in and you're going to need more water. Okay. Okay. So we lose on the average, about two and a half liters a day. We we urinate out about a liter and a half. That's 60%. It's about the same amount as we get from uh, drinking fluids. Uh, fecal matter is only 4% water, uh, water output. Uh, uh, fecal matter is only about 30% solid. Which is scary that somebody has to investigate that to come up with that number. But, uh, it is. Uh, uh, fecal matter is only about 30% solids, uh, so it has a lot of water in there. 
plus then we sweat the color and we breathe out water vapor. So, uh, and we just have uh, the regular evaporation off the surface of our skin. It, to it totals up to just about two and a half liters, um, uh, which matches this. You know, doesn't matter how we get there, it's about the same amount. Whatever goes out is, is matched by what's coming in. And as long as we are keeping this balance, uh, two and a half meters in and two and a half meters out, our body is going to be really healthy. You don't want to have too much water. You don't want to have too little water. We're going to gain water in our food. We're going to gain water uh, in the fridge. We're going to lose water. Uh, and we're going to lose water. But we're going to maintain the uh, Overall, that 24 hour cycle will maintain a constant level. So, and that's fine. That's what we want to do. We want to maintain this constant level because our cells need that water to move, you know, all the solutes around the move. Plasma is 90% water. And we need that water to help carry the uh, hormones. We need to carry the sodium inside there, to carry the, uh, of course, the formed elements in the blood. Uh, to carry uh, glucose uh, to, to uh, all sorts of purposes for the, for the plasma. So we need that water. And when we get thirsty, we, we sort of have to trick uh, the uh, hypothalamus. Of course, the hypothalamus is sort of set up to be tricked. The uh, our osmotic concentration in our body runs somewhere between 280 and 300 milliosmoles. That's you know that's presence of the, the osmotic uh, the solute level in, in our plasma. Nearly all of that is controlled by sodium. So about eighty or ninety, probably ninety percent of our osmotic concentration in our cells is sodium. If we get thirsty, we get thirsty if our salt concentration has increased by only one or two percent. In other words, if we're at 300 million osmoles and our, our salt concentration goes up from 300 million osmoles to 302 million osmoles, we're thirsty. Because a rise in the uh, uh, million osmoles, we go from 300 million osmoles to 302, that is a rise of 2 million osmoles. You would see loss in the Remember this. Um, when, when, when water levels drop in our body, sodium concentration increases. Not because we're adding sodium, we're taking away water. Like the water is evaporating, leaving salt behind. Our bodies are leaving, you know, we're losing water, we're not going to be losing salt at the same time. Our salt levels will rise, not because we're adding more salt, but because there's enough water for that salt to be to dissolve in. So if our osmotic concentration goes up 2%, 1% to 2%, that's all it takes, is and that will make us thirsty. It will activate thirst receptors in the hypothalamus. If our plasma levels drop by 10%, we're bleeding out for whatever reason. We're losing blood. We're drawing more plasma out into the interstitial fluid. We'll get thirsty. Uh, and of course, any kind of pressure change in our body too. But the big one, the one that we encounter all the time is I'm thirsty, you know, I need something to drink. You're working outside, uh, doing something, and you get thirsty because you're perspiring, you're losing water, and then when you lose water, you raise your salt concentration by just one or two percent. But you have not made it thirsty. So something else that happens is when you do get thirsty, the first thing that occurs is posterior pituitary releases antidiuretic hormone. Well, that's not going to quench your thirst, but it's going to tell you to retain more water in your kidneys. So there you are, you've lost water through perspiration, and your water level drops a little bit, your salt concentration goes up, the uh, pituitary, posterior pituitary goes, here's some 88, you know, let's stop cleaning out so much water. On a hot day, if you're working outside and then Mark's getting tired, 
you might notice you don't have a desire to urinate for hours. So you can ask your uh, you release the time that I have come with me to the back with covering more water. So while you run to thirst because you have two percent drop uh, in water, two percent of my sodium, you're going to find uh more. So I'll get your attention to what's up to our you don't want. If you go for a hike in the mountains and you go up uh you know through one of the, the steeper trails in, in the park and it's a hot day. And you know, we all we all tend to overdress. We start out in the morning on a hike and then we end up carrying you know sweaters and, and, and jackets and stuff like that by pack. The, the the saying has always been if you're not peeing, you're not hydrated, you're not drinking enough water. Because if you're if you if you notice that you don't have to pee while you're taking up while you're on a hike on a hot day. Because your, your kidneys are recovering all the water they can in the collection duct. Now, you may be very thirsty, but that's only because it's a very small drop. That's all it takes to make you thirsty. The, um, remember that the solutes, the sodiums, don't leave. So all it takes is a little bit of loss in water to cause the salt level to rise. And a one to two percent rise in salt concentration will trigger thirst. Now, how do you fix that? Well, if you're thirsty, what do you do? You drink something. Take a big glass of your favorite cold beverage, or even uh, a wet beverage. Doesn't matter. Beverage. Drink something, and immediately you feel better. You know, that's not going to affect your your sodium concentration in your body. No, no, I can drink that nice cold drink uh, right now, and I feel better. But all that does is moisten the inside your mouth, and then cause your stomach to stretch as the as the fluid gets there. But that's all it takes to relieve the desire to be thirsty, or the need to be thirsty. The stretch receptors in the stomach, and the, the uh, and the fact that you have moistened the lining of your mouth. Makes you feel better because it will take at least a half an hour or longer for that water to go into your stomach, into your small intestine, be absorbed, be absorbed in the stomach and in the small intestine, get into the plasma, uh, dilute the, the elevated salt concentration back down to 300 milliosmoles and make you and tell the hypothalamus, hey, I'm not thirsty anymore. But we usually feel better right after the you know, drinking something right away, simply because the moistening, moistening of the, the mucous membranes in the mouth and stretching the uh, stomach from the hypothalamus, hey, we're okay now, that I can turn off the uh, this, this need for it. So the, the, the desire for thirst goes away, even though it will take at least a half an hour to get your sodium levels uh, back down to where they belong. But we feel better. So it's... Um, the hypothalamus essentially uh, allows itself to be fooled by, by that process. Because otherwise, it, we would, uh, if we were thirsty and you started drinking water because you were thirsty, and it took 30 minutes or more before your hypothalamus detects that the water level in our plasma had to come back up to where they, were, where they need to be, we would continue to be drinking water. We would overhydrate ourselves. So it's just, I say it allows itself to be pulled, but the desire to drink something very quickly so that we don't overhydrate ourselves. Otherwise, you know, six liters later, and we're sort of floating around with all this water in us, our brain, our hypothalamus has finally figured out that we are now bringing this over water levels back to where they belong. Now, water output in our bodies. We have what we call obligatory water loss. We can't control this water loss. Uh, this is the insensible water loss of things like sweat. We can't control sweat. We can't control what we breathe out through our lungs. We can't control the amount of water in our fecal matter. You know, 
If we retain too much water, our feces would be kind of hard and the patient's constipated. If we don't retain enough water, the, the feces become like diarrhea and, and have all the unpleasant consequences of that. So we have we can't control these uh, water losses, these insensible water losses. It's automatic. The same thing for what we lose in our urine. This is still an obligatory water loss. We have to have this loss of water because we have to use at least a half a liter to flush out the waste pipe. Now where we stay in balance is we're matching, you know, we're matching milliliter to milliliter. We're going to add with that here. We're going to add with that here. So on average, it's two and a half liters out, two and a half liters back in. That will change based on our last amount. The more we exercise, the more uh, we're going to lose water, the more water we'll gain. Uh, the less we exercise, the more sedentary our lifestyle is. We will be losing less water, but taking in less water too. So it will generally stay balanced. And of course, I've said this before, can't emphasize enough the role of antidiuretic hormone. The more ADH we release in the collecting duct, the more water we're going to recover. If we have low levels of ADH, we're going to produce, or no ADH, we're going to produce dilute urine. And we'll probably uh, be able to leave urinate frequently. If we have high levels of ADH, then our urine can be very concentrated. The person that spent his whole day working outside without having any hydration, without drinking any water, when they do get around the urinating, the urine is going to be being a great deal of highly concentrated and with a high salt concentration in there. Let's not take away the uh, the uh, the way to get rid of it because they have retained that uh, energy throughout the day. So it just depends. Yeah. Antidiuretic hormone allows us to produce a concentrated urine urine by retaining as much water as possible. So, wow. And the hypothalamus is going to be the control center for ADH. Remember, hypothalamus monitors by the, the hypothalamus monitors the salt concentrations in the body. This is another center. Uh, center. But everything that's working on the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus then controls the posterior pituitary and release antidiuretic hormone or not. Okay. It's only when they, uh, when antidiuretic hormone is inhibited by alcohol, then it, uh, the hypothalamus can't function. So it is the osmoreceptors that are going to be the driver here for releasing this. So. Now, dehydration. Very easy symptom of dehydration is if you can take skin and pull it up and form, you know, it's called pimping. If you pull the skin up and it stays up and doesn't drop back down like that, you know, it's, you know, it's, that's a very good sign of dehydration. There's not enough water in the intracellular or extracellular uh, fluids. People that have been bleeding out, a uh, chronic, uh, you know, uh, slow long-term bleed may be dehydrated. <clears throat> a person who has suffered extreme burns, uh, third degree burns, uh, burns down the bone, uh, will all cause significant water loss. The, um, yeah, if you've ever seen, <laughs> Really like, okay. I'm not trying to ruin barbecue sauce. No. But the barbecue has nothing to do with, with third degree burn, but a third degree burn looks like barbecue because you're going to burn the tissue down to the bone. No sauce. You're going to the tissue down to the bone. Thank you. So you're contributing to you know, when you burn it down to the bottom, you destroy the pain receptors. Third degree burns really don't hurt because the pain receptors are 
But to discover all this tissue, we can have control over water loss. And so patients are first to learn to protect the body from the losing water. You know, we can't have a and so you're going to have to be pumping water, but you know, not pumping, but running water back through it back into them, so they're losing it on a constant basis. Well, in fact, the water on the damaged tissue is becoming a breeding ground for bacteria. So you've got to keep the patient hydrated and also make sure they don't develop, you know, some sort of infection that's going to kill them because there's a lot, there's a lot of bad things going on with the first week work. I mean, the only positive thing is that most of it doesn't hurt because you burn away the pain receptors. So, and doesn't do anything for what's on the edges of that. But you will, your patient will lose water constantly uh, because of the, the, the tissue damage. So, so the next time you're having barbecue with somebody and you want to get more of your share, then there it says, hey, you know, that looks just like a third degree burn. Yeah. yeah. There you go, and you'll have more barbecue. Yeah. You'll probably be asked to leave at the same time too. But yeah. So anyway, the uh, the sign of dehydration: they're thirsty, their mouth is dry, uh, the uh, their, their skin may be appear flushed, you know, like like they've had, you know, like they like they've been embarrassed, or you know, uh, it, it maybe they've been out in the sun a little too long. Um, but it, if it continues, you know, we we actually generally die about three days after without any water. So the, you know, significant dehydration uh, is fatal. So, but the giveaway, of course, is going to be: does the skin stand up or does it not? So, and of course, here's dehydration. You saw this before. What will happen is, you know, there's our there's our uh, cell. If we are losing water from the plasma. We're losing water from the interstitial fluid that raises the salt concentration. Um, there we go. That raises the salt concentration in the interstitial fluid because we've lost water, and that will draw water then out from oh, too far. There we go. That will tell the cells here to release water. The cells will try to. Uh, compensate for the water loss here. This is osmotic concentration. Now, with the loss of water, the osmotic concentration is higher. Remember, we don't lose the salt. So the cells are going to try and release more water because water goes from high water to low water. We move out there, and the cells end up shrinking, and they don't like that. So, now one of the other things we see is. Um, in diabetes insipidus, we talked about that a lot. Uh, we have a significant water loss here. Uh, diabetes insipidus, only thing it, it, it uh, matches up with uh, diabetes mellitus is you have the constant urination and the constant thirst. The constant urination in diabetes insipidus comes from a lack of anti diuretic hormones. Your patient may have a tumor. Uh, in the posture of pituitary, they may have a tumor in the hypothalamus and trigger, triggering the production of uh, inhibiting the production of ADH. Uh, or maybe the kidney decides, I'm not going to recognize ADH anymore. So, what happens is your patient has no control over it. You know, has, <clears throat> it no antidiuretic hormones prevent water loss, so they pee all the time. And when you pee all the time, you're going to be thirsty all the time. So your diet, your uh, diabetes insipidus patient will have two of the signs of diabetes mellitus. They will be thirsty and they'll be peeing all the time, but they will have normal blood glucose levels and they won't have this ravenous hunger. That third sign, uh, you know, is for a diabetic patient, diabetic <clears throat> diabetes mellitus will give you a patient that is always hungry because the cells aren't happy. The cells are not being fed. They're not getting their glucose. So the, the hunger issue is drives your patient so they can eat to replace glucose, which is important. You don't have you know, either defective insulin or no insulin. So don't get the two mixed up. 
Insipidus is only about fluid. You pee a lot and you're thirsty a lot. Mellitus is, yes, you pee a lot and you're thirsty a lot and you're hungry. The reason you pee a lot in diabetes mellitus is because the filter uh, has a uh, higher concentration of glucose than the plasma. Now, in Normally, our glucose is all recovered in our doctrinal But in diabetes mellitus, we have so much glucose that we can't recover at all. So the glucose that you can recover, remember the cells aren't using it. The cells are not getting that glucose in diabetes mellitus. So here's our filter here in yellow, right here, which is what would be considered a normal, maybe like let's just say less glucose in the in the capillary than in the filtering. What will happen is because there's so much glucose over here in the filtrate, the solute concentration is much higher than the solute particle. Which is the solute particle. The increasing the filtrate concentration. Like this, and so you would have a long build up point, not much action. But the, the bottom line is that the reason your patient with diabetes is all this is because of too much glucose. Excessive glucose is often found in sodium, and so you can absorb more water out of the capillaries, and that water goes into the filtrate, which becomes urine. It is a constant change in urinary and cause the press of glucose in your filter, glucose in your urine, and your diabetic patient will have glucose in your urine. This is something not getting fed. They're going to pee a lot, they're going to be thirsty all the time because they're peeing a lot, and they are going to be hungry. Similar, the first two symptoms are similar to insipidus, peeing all the time, thirsty all the time. But an insipidus patient is going to have perfectly normal glucose levels. Uh, they're not going to have any issues with their insulin. The glucose levels are just fine. They just can't stop peeing and because they pee all the time. They're thirsty all the time. Here, your patient's peeing all the time because of the high glucose particle concentration found inside uh, the filtrate. Uh, that's going to draw water out of the capillaries. So, okay. Let's go ahead and stop here, and we'll finish this up on uh, Monday morning in class. And um, then <clears throat> I want to need a little more time to make sure everything is set up properly. We, assuming the computer works, uh, 